Hi everyone, welcome back. In this section we're starting a new chapter. Now chapter 3 is all about differentiation rules and we're going to get to some applications of derivatives. Now the first part, differentiation rules, is what we're going to start today. Now these are going to be quick methods for finding derivatives of functions. Right now all we have is the definition of the derivative to work with. So anytime we want to find the derivative of a function, we've got to go back to this limit definition and work out the value of the limit. Our goal here is to find quicker methods for finding derivatives. These are known as the differentiation rules. So as a start, let's look at this first example. The derivative of a constant function. Well, that's going to be zero. The derivative of a constant function is zero. There's a couple of ways to look at this. The first way is to say, well, if it's a constant function, then the graph is a horizontal line. So maybe that's our constant function of height c. At any point along this line, what is the slope of the tangent line? Well, the tangent line is also going to be a horizontal line. I'll just draw a little line segment there. The tangent line is actually going to overlap the entire line, so you can't distinguish between the tangent line and the line itself, so that's why I'm just going to draw a little line segment. What is the slope of this tangent line? Well, it's also a horizontal line, so it has a slope of zero. So that's a, a graphical way to look at why this derivative of a constant function should be zero. However, in all of these results that we're about to derive, we need to solidify them based on the definition of derivative. So here's the definition of derivative in terms of a limit. Let's verify that we really do have the derivative of a constant function is zero based on this definition. So the derivative of our constant function is going to be the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h, but f of x plus h, well f is a constant function in this case, so it's just c, minus, well what's f of x? Well x is, uh, f is just the constant function, so that's also c, and all of this is divided by h, so the numerator in this expression, c minus c, that's zero, zero over h, so that value is always going to be zero, so the limit as h goes to zero is also zero, and so we verified this from the definition of derivative. Now we're going to do this for all of the results we're going to develop today. So let's look at the next uh, class of functions we want to look at. Here we've looked at constant functions. What's the next class of functions we want to look at? Well, we're going to look at the power functions. What are the power functions? Well, they're x raised to any power. So for example, x raised to the power of 1, or just x itself, we've already seen that the derivative of that is 1 at any given x value. What about x squared? Well, we've already seen that the derivative of x squared is 2x. And x cubed, the derivative of 3x squared. We've also seen another power function in a previous lecture, x to the 2 thirds. And we found that its derivative is 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Now, all of these we found using the definition of derivative. Now let's look a little bit more closely at these. Can we see a pattern emerging? Well, let's look at this x squared. This number that comes out front seems to be coincidentally the same as the exponent in the function we started with. And what's our new exponent here? Well, our new exponent was 1 less than the previous one. So it seems that that exponent when we took the derivative, jumped down out front, and then lost one from it. Let's see if that pattern holds. We started with a cube. The derivative had the 3 out front, and the new exponent was 1 less than the old one. Does that hold for this result over here? Well, it looks like the 2 thirds has jumped out front, and the new exponent is 1 less than the old one. 2 thirds minus 1 is negative 1 thirds. So this new exponent, the exponent of the derivative, is one less than the old one. Okay, does that actually hold for the first one? Well, let's see. x, we can think of it as x to the power of 1. So when we use this pattern to take its derivative, it looks like, I'll do a little equality here, it looks like it's 1 times x raised to the power of a new exponent, which is 1 less than the old one, x to the power of 0. And 1 times x to the 0 is exactly 1. So that pattern also holds for the first one. This pattern, even though we've only looked at it for four examples, actually turns out to be true for any power function. And that's known as the power rule. 
So what it says is that if I'm staring at a power function, x to the n, and I want to compute its derivative, I can do it quickly by just moving the exponent down front and taking one away. So it looks like this very magical rule now for taking the derivative of a power function. And we got it from these four examples. That's not enough to justify why this rule is true for any possible power n. So what I want to do is I want to just justify why is this rule true for any power of n. Now I'm going to have to be content right now with just looking at it for n an integer. So for n an integer, it's slightly more complicated when n's not an integer to verify this. But we can certainly do it and we'll do it later on, just not now. But for n an integer, how do we work out the derivative of x to the n? Well, we only have the limit definition to work with. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of the function, which is the nth power function, evaluated at x plus h minus x to the power of n all over h. We can be guided by how we worked out the values of the limit for these previous derivatives by realizing that what we did was we expanded this x plus h to the power of 2 or the power of 3. In the case of the 2 thirds, we did another little bit of algebraic manipulation. Um, what can we do in general here? Well, there is a result that we have from our past which tells us what we can do in the case when n's an integer. And it's called the binomial theorem. So let's just recall it here. I'm not going to write out the full binomial theorem, just enough of it of what we're going to use. So what does the binomial theorem says? Well, it says that if you've got an expression of the form, uh, the sum of two things raised to the power of an integer, n, remember that's x plus h times x plus h times x plus h, where there's n factors, what does that equal? Well, when we expand this out, we're going to get an x to the n, and all the way down the line, we're going to get an h to the n. Now what's happening in between is we're going to get a bunch of cross terms. So let's go ahead and list those cross terms in order, in descending order of the power of x. So we've got an x to the n minus 1 and an h. And it turns out there's going to be n of those. And what about the next one? Well it turns out that these coefficients are going to be coming from this binomial function or this choice function. So the next one is going to be n choose 2 of x to the n minus 2 h squared plus, and then we go down the list where we are decreasing the power of x each time and increasing the power of h each time until we get all the way down to h to the power of n and x to the power of 0. Now these coefficients that come up in the later terms, they're given uh, they're known as the binomial coefficients. They're given by this choice function, uh, n choose 2, n choose 3, etc., that you may have learned in the past. It's not essential that we know what these things are for this particular argument. What we care about, however, is that all of this stuff that goes on after the first two terms involve terms with h squared in them or higher. So, I would think then that h cubed involves an h squared as a factor with an additional factor of h. So this is what I'm writing as terms with h squared. There's an h squared and h cubed all the way up to h to the n. That's all we're going to need from this expression. It starts off x to the n plus an x to the n minus 1 times h with a coefficient of n and then plus what we call higher order terms in h. How is that going to help us? Well, let's have a look. This is going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0. Using the binomial theorem, we've got, we got that this is x to the n plus n times x to the n minus 1 times h plus terms with h squared in them minus an x to the n, that final x to the n on the top. And all of that's over h. Now what do we notice? We notice that much like in the case of the x squared and the x cubed where we worked out all the details, that the same thing happens here. We get that highest power of x cancels off. And what survives? Well, what survives is a term involving h and then these higher order terms involving h. But we're going to divide by h, so h can go into each of those terms. What that means in our next line is that this first term, the h cancels, and we just get left with an n x to the n minus 1. What about the next few terms? 
Well, those involve h squared in them. And when I divide by h, they now are terms with, well, one of those h's would have canceled off of every one of those terms. So now they're terms involving at least a factor of h in them. So when we take the limit as h goes to 0, all of the stuff involving the h's go to 0, with the exception of that very first term. That's an n x to the n minus 1. And that proves our result. So we use the binomial theorem to get an idea of what the expansion is, and then work out the limit. And we've got our power rule for an integer n. Now, I did it just for an integer. For other powers, rational numbers, irrational numbers, so any other real number, where we can use another technique to, to find that the derivative is n times x to the n minus 1. And this is a technique known as uh, logarithmic differentiation, and we will get to it in a later section. Um, so for right now, what we have is a nice handy new tool to add to our toolbox. Derivative of power of x, we can always get it. It's just move the exponent down and take one away from it. So that's our first tool. What's our next one? Well, what we'd like to do is be able to figure out how to compute the derivative of a constant times a function, provided we know the derivative of the function itself. So right now we know how to differentiate x squared, for example, from the power rule. Can we find the derivative of 5x squared? That's a constant times x squared. Well, what the constant multiple rule says is absolutely you can find the derivative of that. You just have to move the constant outside of the derivative, so move it out front, and then just focus your attention on the derivative of whatever the function is that was being multiplied by the constant z. So the derivative of 5x squared would be 2 times 5x, or 10x. So the constant just gets multiplied to the end result. So let's have a look at proving this. So how do we know that this is true? We're always going to have to go back to our definition of derivative to verify these results. Once we've got them verified, we're free to use them at any time now. So let's go back and verify this. We only need to do this once. The limit as h goes to 0 of c times f of x plus h minus c times f of x all over h. So now I need to work out this limit. What I notice is that there's this common factor of c in both those expressions. I can pull that all the way up front by our properties of limits. So then that's f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Ah, and what's sitting here is the derivative of f. So this says that it's equal to the constant times the derivative of f, which I'll write in this case as f prime. And so we verified that result. Okay, so we're starting to accumulate some nice results for allowing us to compute derivatives quickly. Let's look at the next one. The sum rule. If I want to compute the derivative of a sum of two functions, f plus g, this tells me I just need to compute their individual derivatives and add the results. So for example, if I want to compute the derivative of x squared plus 3x to the fourth, then it tells me I just need to work out the derivative of x squared. I know that by the power rule, it's 2x. I need to work out the derivative of 3x to the fourth. I know the derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed. By the constant multiple rule, I just need to multiply by 3. So this is 12x cubed. And so that's an illustration of the power rule, the constant multiple rule, and this sum rule all used together to find a derivative very quickly. So let's go ahead and prove this. What do we need to do? Well, let's write down what the derivative is. First of all, the derivative of f of x plus g of x is what we're trying to work out. All we have to work with at this stage is the definition of derivative. So it's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h plus g of x plus h. So that's the function evaluated at x plus h minus the function evaluated at x all over h. Now we can split things up. I can look at this as, well, collecting all the things in f together, and then collecting all the things involving g together. And all of that's going to be over h. Now I can divide an h into each one of those terms. So that's f of x plus h minus f of x all over h plus g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. 
And now we're free to take the limit of a sum to be the sum of the limits, provided each of the limits exist. Well, we know that the limit of this exists, and we know that the limit of this exists. Why do we know that? Because we're assuming f and g are differentiable functions. If we assume f and g are differentiable functions, then we know both these limits exist. Why do they exist? Well, they are equal to the derivative. So this is equal to the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. And so we've proven that result now. So now whenever we want to compute the derivative of a sum, just split them off into their individual pieces and work on those independently, and then add the results. Now bringing this all together, our example above here was a special case of this, but in general, bringing all these results together, we have now a quick method for finding the derivative of any polynomial function. I just look at it term by term. That was a previous result. It says look at each of these terms individually and add the corresponding derivatives of these terms. So let's look at the first term, a n x to the n. a n is some constant, so I can just move that out front and then take the derivative of x to the n. That's the power rule. The n comes down and the new exponent is x to the n minus 1. And we just move across the polynomial in this way, term by term. The n minus 1 comes down, multiplied to the a n minus 1. The new exponent should be an n minus 2, and that's our next term. So this one went to here, and so on. a1x gets differentiated to just a1 times the derivative of x, which is 1, so this becomes a1. What's the derivative of a constant? A derivative of a constant was 0, and so we can leave the 0 off of the sum, because 0 plus anything is just whatever the thing you're adding it to. So we now have a quick method for finding derivatives of polynomials. Let's put this to practice.